right, well, good morning. He is risen. Of course, normally we have a sunrise service and then the Easter breakfast and, uh, you know, the presentations. But under the lockdown restrictions, things are a little bit different now than what they were. But we praise the Lord we can uh, be here this morning. So I've changed. Normally, we're in Second Samuel going through a series uh, I've changed that, of course, what normally would have been the sunrise service. I'm going to change it to an Easter message. And uh, one of the things that's a challenge for Easter and Christmas for a preacher is to find something kind of a new angle or a new approach. And, and the Lord always gives something that's interesting as I was studying the resurrection. Uh, you know... What what about after the resurrection? So we're going to talk about that. The whole center of the Easter season, and matter of fact, the whole pivot of all of history is who is Jesus Christ? That's the center point. Because if you're like uh, the Mormons or like the Jehovah's Witness and Jesus Christ was a created being, then the crucifixion didn't mean anything. Uh, because that's not the Christ that's presented in the scripture. If he's very God or very God, then he could mean something. If he was a phantom, as, uh, you know, the, the, the Cetist uh, said, then it wouldn't mean anything, right? It, it had to be a real a death, right? It had to be a death by blood. If, if he was... Uh, of two natures, it wouldn't mean anything. You know, he had to be both man of very man and God of very God. And so the whole pivotal point of the resurrection is who is Jesus Christ? And so when, when, we, when, we, when we come to the point of, uh, of, of looking at the passages that we're going to be dealing with, this entire section, and we're going to be doing that again in the morning message at 11 o'clock, is centering around Jesus Christ. Now, quite often what we do when we come to an Easter message is we talk about the trial, we talk about the uh, crucifixion, right? And we talk about the resurrection. But what happens after that? So we know there's 40 days where Jesus is teaching his disciples. We know there's an ascension. But you see that resurrection isn't the end of the, of the Easter story. It isn't the end of the story of the crucifixion and the resurrection. There's something beyond that. So here in Hebrews chapter 1, if you turn with me in your scriptures, to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, it says, And God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. By the way, these long flowing sentences indicate that Hebrews was probably written by Paul also, right? <laughs> he, he takes a paragraph and makes it one sentence. And so this is, a, this is kind of indication of Pauline type of writing. And so here we have, he says, at various times in various places, God sent prophets. And these prophets were to point to the ultimate um, solution to the fall of man. The ultimate solution to sin is that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would be sent. And he said these prophets pointed to this one person, Jesus Christ. And, of course, when Jesus was raised from the dead, that's what he did with the disciples of Emmaus. Luke chapter 24, he went all the way back through Moses and all the way back through the prophets. They all pointed to me. And I fulfilled all those things. 
And so at various times, and by the way, I want to, this is not part of the message, but let me, uh, in case you're curious, let me get this out of the way first. How did he become a little uh, better than the angels? I mean, wasn't he always better than the angels? I mean, he was God of God. Well, Jesus Christ humbled himself, which means he emptied himself out of the privileges of Godhood and became, what does it say in, 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 um, in uh, Psalm chapter 2? He says, you know, what is man that you might consider him? Or is that Psalm 8, uh, that you might consider him? He made a little bit lower than the angels. Well, Jesus became a man, right? But at the resurrection, he took back on the full privilege and full glory of his deity and became greater than the angels, even though he started out greater than the angels, he humbled himself and he took all that back on and became a more greater inheritance. And by the way, the book of Hebrews goes through that. He's greater than angels. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than Joshua. He's greater. And he goes on the law itself. And so here, the prophets pointed to him. Now, the scriptures assigned Jesus Christ's seven tasks in creation. And so the seven tasks he assigned, first of all, he's the creator of all things. John chapter 1. There was nothing that's been created which was not created by him. Right? In John chapter 1, he's the creator of all things. So he's assigned as the creator. So God made the plan. He turns it over to his son. The son did the creation. And the spirit was involved. It hovers over the waters. So all three in the Trinity or the triune God was involved. Secondly, he is the sustainer of all things. It says in Colossians chapter 1, by him all things what? They consist. He holds it all together, right? He holds everything together, which has always been fascinating to me is the fact that the very nails and cross that he was uh, crucified by were held together by him. <laughs> you know, and so he sustains. So one is greater, number two, sustainer. Number three, we're told that he was the redeemer of mankind. That while we're yet sinners, Christ what? died for us, you know, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. So he creates, he sustains, and he is the redeemer. And that's what the whole Easter story is about, the crucifixion. Number four, he's a chief born amongst the resurrection. We will be resurrected because he was first resurrected. As a matter of fact, we find in Daniel chapter 12, he says that everyone is resurrected, some to eternal life and some to eternal damnation, right? In the condemnation. And so, so because of Jesus was raised, we are raised. And those in Christ will be raised unto eternal life. And those who are not in Christ will be raised unto eternal death. So number four. Uh, four is the fact he's a chief born, the very first born of the resurrection. Number five, he is the intercessor between believers and God the Father. First uh, Timothy chapter two and verse five tells us that there's one intercessor between man and God, and that's the man who? Jesus Christ. There is no priesthood between us and God. We come directly through Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus says, when you pray to the Father, pray in my name. And anything that you pray, honor in my name, it shall be given unto you. And so he is our intercessor. So he's a creator. He's a sustainer. He is the redeemer. He's the firstborn or chiefborn amongst the resurrection. And number five, he makes intercession for us. And he's low, he's with us how long? Always unto the end of the age. Number six, he's assigned to the point that he's going to come for us one day. Those in Christ, he's going to come. There's going to be a rapture. You know, the trump shall sound. We're told in First Thessalonians 4, the dead in Christ will raise first. And then we which are alive will be caught up with him in the air. And who is looking forward to that, right? <laughs> Amen. And so that's the resurrection. So come Lord Jesus. And so, and then we're going to reign with him a thousand years. And depends on how, you know, how you did as a believer, uh, what your position's going to be. Some are governors, you know, some are going to be mayors or whatever, you know, in this kingdom. And we're going to be ruling for a thousand years with him. And finally, the seventh task is he is judge. 
Matter of fact, we find that all judgment, all authority has been given to him, Matthew 28, 18. And he is the judge. First of all, he's going to judge our works as the saints. We're going to stand before in 1 Corinthians 3. And those things we did for Christ will come out as gold and silver and precious stone. But those things that weren't done for Christ are going to be what? Burned up as wood, hay, and stubble like it, it just wasn't done for him. And, but then also there's a great white throne judgment. And the great white throne judgment is where everyone stands before uh, the Lord and their works are judged. And, in, and those not in Christ will be cast into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15, where the fire never dies, neither does the worm die. And that uh, lake of fire was actually originally created for the devil and his angels, the demons. And so those are the seven tasks that Jesus was assigned by the Father as the creator, as the sustainer of the universe, as the redeemer of mankind, as the chief born amongst of the resurrection uh, he makes intercession for us, he will rapture us, we'll rule with him, and then he'll be judging our works and be judging uh, those who are lost for eternal punishment. And so those are the seven. Now, what I want to focus on here is the fact this says not only was he taken on high, now he sits at the right hand of the majesty on high. He sits at the right hand of the Father. Well, what's he doing after the crucifixion, after the burial, after the resurrection, after the ascension? What's he doing? And by the way, before we get to the ascension, he actually makes an offering, it says, in the heavenly tabernacle, the Holy of Holies there, uh, for us once and for all. Doesn't have to be done again. Uh, after all that, he assumes his high priestly role for us. Now, why does he have to assume his high priestly role for us? Is because we're not in our glorified body. We still are sinners, right? Now, by the way, Paul mentions the resurrection more times than he does the crucifixion. I don't know if you knew that. He mentions the resurrection 25 times in his epistles. And so, because of Christ, the key point, the key moment in the history of the world is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But the key evidence that the crucifixion was accepted by the Father is the resurrection. How would we know that God the Father accepted the payment, but that he raised Jesus from the dead, right? So the resurrection is the proof and a matter of fact, Paul got in trouble several times by preaching the resurrection from the dead. And so the resurrection is the key evidence that we have that it is finished and it is accomplished. Uh, and so when Jesus is raised from the dead, we have two major evidences that my faith is the proper faith. Number one, all the prophecies, right? Jesus walking along, you got the disciples of uh, Emmaus, you got Cleopas and, and the other disciple, and, and he said, and they're, you know, he's walking, remember the scene, he's walking along and they're sad, they're going back to Emmaus. Emmaus is a 10 mile walk, by the way from Jerusalem. It's not down the street. <laughs> and so they're walking back to Emmaus and down the road and, and they're all talking sad. And Jesus comes up and says, hey, well, why are you guys so sad? He said, are you the only one in Jerusalem that doesn't know what's happened? Well, actually, Jesus was the only one in Jerusalem that didn't know what was happening. <laughs> and so, and, he, and they all talked about, you know, Jesus Christ. We thought he would be uh, the Savior, right? He, you know, thought he'd be the one to set up the kingdom. And he's gone. He was crucified. He said, all foolish ones. And slow of heart and slow to believe. Should this not have happened to the Christ? And so he started back with Moses and went all the way through the prophecies. The prophecies that, that there would be a man born who would, uh, who would uh, strike a blow to Satan's head and, and a mortal blow. And, and the, the prophecies about that, uh, you know, he would be crucified. Psalms 22 describes in, in detail the crucifixion scene. 
700 years before crucifixion was even invented as a punishment. <laughs> and a thousand years before it happened with Jesus Christ. And so it describes that perfectly. And, 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 and don't you know, it says, by his stripes we are healed. And, and don't you know, the government must be on his shoulder. And that, it, all these things that he's going through, he says, oh, foolish ones to believe these things. And so he gives the evidence and the testimony and witnesses. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at the Gospels, seven times he told his disciples, I'm going to be handed over. I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified. And I'm going to raise again. Seven times. And they just wouldn't believe. As a matter of fact, we only have one person in the Gospels that said understood this, and that was Mary of Bethany. So she anointed his body for what? For the burial, right? And so she anointed. She's the only one that seemed to get it, right? She's the only one that says, "Wow, I, I, I see what's going on." The disciples missed it all. Matter of fact, Peter, remember, in Matthew 16, was going to prevent it. No, this is not going to happen to you. And uh, Jesus said, get behind me, what? Satan. Satan. You know, you speak the words of men and not the words of God. And so here you have this, this, this prophecy that points to Jesus Christ. Now, what of sins then committed after? See, this is the problem people have. Okay, he paid for my sins, but I'm still a sinner, right? I mean, you know, I, I came to Christ, but I still commit sins. So, what about those sins? Well, that's his high priestly role. Because Jesus Christ paid for sins past, present, and future. When it said he paid for all sins, he paid for all of them, right? All the sins. And so, so, so here we had, he, that's why he's sitting at the right hand of the Father as a high priest at the right hand. Jesus continues to make intercession for us. That's why we find in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Because he is our high priest. He is the one who applies his uh, blood-drenched atonement to our sins. And so we're justified. And why do we have to be justified? Is because we continue to sin. And also Satan is at the throne doing what? You're right, accusing us day by day. Matter of fact, that's one of the names of Satan is the accuser. <laughs> and every day is accusing, and Jesus says, it's under the blood. It's under the blood. And so we're justified, that is, we're declared to be righteous, even though we are not. <clears throat> so the crucifixion paid for our sins, the resurrection declared that the sin payment was accepted by God the Father, but his high priest's intercession on, behalf, on our behalf effectively thwarts all attempts by Satan to reverse our justification or our status as joint heirs of the kingdom of God. And so that high priestly uh, ministry office of Jesus Christ is very important to us is the fact that we are accusable. We do commit sin, right? We are accusable. And matter of fact, we're told in the scriptures what sin's about, so we're not excusable. <laughs> so we're accusable because we still think bad things and we still say bad things and we have bad attitudes. Maybe none of you, but I mean, you know, <laughs> and, and we, we uh, maybe aren't quite as truthful as we should be. And maybe you're not quite as uh, gracious as we should be or as just as we should be. And so we are accusable. And we aren't excusable. <laughs> he who knows to do good and does it not what? To him it's sin. But Jesus Christ says it's taken care of. That's my child. And I've taken care of the sin. And so that high priestly position, we find also over in Hebrews chapter 4, you know, he was 
uh, tempted in all ways such as we, but that without sin, that, that 416 there, it says Jesus Christ came that not only that he might pay for our sins, not only that he might redeem us, but also that he might continue to justify us before the Father in heaven. <laughs> And so we should not minimize that high priestly role. That's why we pray to the Father through the Son. He's our intercessor. He's our high priest. And you don't have to go, and I know there's denominations where you have to go to a priest to get the absolution of sin, and, and where you go to a priest and, and they uh, uh, tell you what to do to, to be able to uh, recompense your sin. Well, that's not, that priest can do nothing for you. <laughs> Matter of fact, that priest couldn't absolve his own sins. <laughs> because we have one priest. And that's Jesus Christ who sits at the right hand of the Father. And so this is after the resurrection, you have this high priestly role of Jesus Christ. So the crucifixion resurrection fulfills Christ's redempted role in time so that Jesus Christ can enter his high priestly role on our behalf to the very end of time. And that high priestly role will come to an end when all things are reconciled to him, that's what we find in 1 Corinthians 15, when, every, when all Jesus' enemies are made his footstool, then he'll turn everything back over to God the Father, who will be all in all. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 28. And so at the end of that, we'll be joint heirs with Jesus Christ, no longer under the power of sin, no longer under the presence of sin, and no longer under the presentation to commit sin. All that's taken care of. And we enter into eternity with him, an eternity where he says the, that the half has not been told, right? The length and the breadth and the depth and the and height of all things that, Christ, that the Lord has for us hasn't been told. It's, it, it's something that's going to be absolutely amazing. And so Ephesians chapter 1, we have this dual function Ephesians chapter 1, we're sealed by who? Holy Spirit. He seals us under the day of redemption. And then here we find that Jesus Christ then intercedes for us before the throne of God. And so we're, we're, we're double taken care of. <laughs> and so sealed by the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ intercedes for us. And this is a, mar a marvelous, marvelous thing that we have. And so he's our defender. And that's why not only is he the captain of our salvation, he's also the sustainer of our relationship with the Father. And so I, I thought it would be important to look at this. Now I want you to notice a couple things uh, that he ends with here in this passage. Jesus, because he is our Redeemer, because he is our intercessor, also guarantees our inheritance. So we inherit all things, joint heirs with the throne of God, to the throne of God, and we're joint heirs because Jesus has taken care of all this. Now, now I want to just stop for just a second and note, none of this we did for ourselves. We couldn't, right? We were totally incapable of doing anything. He did it all. You know, you know Jesus paid it all, all to him I what? Oh, he, he paid it all. We just accepted his payment. And by the way, he also initiated our faith too. And so we have nothing to boast on. You know, we were talking about that yesterday, if you remember, at the men's breakfast. Naaman was told to go and dip in the Jordan River. Not told to do a mighty thing because it had nothing to do with Naaman. <laughs> nothing to do with something Naaman could do. The only one could heal him was God. Exactly. And so all we had to do was obey. You ever notice that, that God does everything and all we have to do is obey? I mean, uh, Adam was told to obey. All you have to you do anything you want. <laughs> Except for what? One tree, right? One lousy tree. You, you, that, that, just stay away from this one tree. You can do that, can't you? Wet paint, right? Just, uh, <laughs> you know, just it, it didn't do it, right? That's all you had to do. All you have to do is just obey, you know. And, and, and so that's what we do. We receive Jesus Christ, and all these things come with that. 
You know, it's sort of like the commercial. Wait, there's more. You know, he's your redeemer. Wait, there's more. He's also going to raise you to a glorified way. Wait, there's more. He's going to intercede for you. Wait, there's more. You're going to rule with him. I mean, this, it just goes on and on. And so we have, here we have this. So we have an inheritance because of this. And that's why we have this, what I've always thought was a strange uh, passage, which is a marvelous passage, where it says, the reason why he went through all this suffering, the reason why he became a man, the reason why he, he went through the ridicule, the reason why he went through the cross, is for the joy that was set before him. Joy? You know, being ridiculed, being whipped, being nailed to a cross, joy? No, the joy was that he gained many sons and daughters for glory. He did it for us. He wanted us, right? He wanted us to be part of, joint heirs with him, part of his kingdom. The joy was not, what, and by the way, this is just a side note, but listen. We, if you're going to serve the Lord, you're going to go through some trauma, but there's something you've got to look beyond the trauma to the reward, right? And so uh, I was listening to an old message from James Montgomery Boyce this morning, and then later on, Lon Solomon. I used to listen to Zacharias, but that, that became a problem. Uh, is the fact that here the, the guards, both of them were talking about the same thing. I thought it was interesting. But the guards accepted money to say that Jesus Christ was stolen by the disciples, which was a problem, right? But they accepted a temporary gain and suffered a permanent loss. Whereas when we come and serve the Lord and we actually pay a price for serving the Lord, we suffer a temporary loss for a permanent gain. See how this reverses? And that's what Jesus did. He suffered a temporary loss so he might gain many sons of glory. And so this is exactly what. So we have a joint inheritance with him. And, and it's a joy to him. We're the bride of Christ. Uh, Jesus in his perfect divinity qualified him to be the perfect sacrifice, the perfect redeemer, and the perfect high priest, and he did it once and for all. And I said, wait a minute, isn't he still the high priest? Yes, but he sat down once for all time, and he hasn't left there. He, he doesn't take a break. <laughs> doesn't say, hey, I need five minutes here. You know, he's constantly making intercession for us. And we have a God that neither sleeps, you know, nor is he distracted, right? And so he's constantly our high priest and constantly making intercession. And that is why uh, in Psalm 110, in verse 4, he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Because he's priest and king who's able to make intercession for us able to bring us to glory. And that's what our faith hinges on. This Jesus Christ, God of God, man of man, making sacrifice, is our high priest. Amen? Okay, Let, let's pray. And then if there's any comments or questions, we have a few minutes to do that. It's kind of morph into a little Sunday school lesson here. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for not only your role as Redeemer, and your role as intercessor, but also your role as high priest for us, Lord. And Lord, thank you that you sit at the throne, even right now, making intercession before the Father for us. Dear Heavenly Father, just draw us ever closer to us, that your name might be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen.